Ah, James Bond and Christmas. The two fit surprisingly well, like hand and glove, gold and finger, pussy and cock. Pit. Maybe I've just been indoctrinated by years of Bond films regularly appearing on Christmas TV schedules, but there's just something about the series that lends itself so well to festive viewing. There's obviously On Her Majesty's Secret Service, which is pretty much the series' de facto Christmas film. Merry Christmas, 007. But you can get festive vibes from any other number of snowy Bond adventures, and we can't forget the beloved angel on every Bond fan's tree, Dr. Christmas Jones herself. I thought Christmas only comes once a year. But what do you do when you've already blasted through every Bond film that features snow when you've still got days left until Christmas? Why, you turn to the Hallmark Channel. Of course. Released in 2011, A Princess for Christmas, or A Christmas Princess as it's titled here in the UK, or if you're in Canada, it's Christmas at Castlebury Hall. Why does this thing have so many titles? Uh, well, whatever you want to call it, it features the legendary Bond star in one of his final acting roles. Hallmark have a reputation for producing countless cookie-cutter festive films, and I can't imagine that A Princess for Christmas will be much elevated from any of those. But hey, it's December, and I'm a Roger Moore obsessive, so I figured let's give A Princess for Christmas a whirl. Maybe I'll love it, and it'll become a festive staple. Maybe doing the heavy lifting in that sentence. The film begins by introducing us to our lead, Jules Daly, played by Katie McGrath, best known to me as the PA from Jurassic World who receives a disproportionately sadistic death scene based upon what we see her character do in that film. Jules pedals old tat for a living in antiques and stuff? Really? That is the name of the shop? Was old things and crap already taken? Jules loves her job, so it's a shame that her cash-strapped boss has taken the difficult decision to let her go, which only adds to the young lady's list of things to be miserable about. I can only imagine how difficult this year has been for you. Losing your sister and brother-in-law last Christmas. Sorry, I probably didn't need to add that last bit, as you were likely very aware of what event I was referring to. Specifically, that they died horribly in that awful threshing machine accident. Jules is now the guardian of her deceased sister and brother-in-law's ne'er-do-well children, Milo and Maddie, who spend their days driving their nanny closer and closer to an early grave. That it! I quit! Time to take that job with the Von Trapp children! Jules's prospects are looking decidedly grim, until Miles Richardson's Paisley Winterbottom Autumn appears on her doorstep. He's there on behalf of her deceased brother-in-law's father. See, Jules's sister followed the smell of cash and married well above her station into nobility, and now the kid's minted but estranged grandfather is inviting the kids over for Christmas. Jules initially refuses the invitation, but after reconsidering, the trio make their way to Romania, or rather the fictional country of Castleberry, where their grandfather is a duke. Wow. We're not in Buffalo anymore. The family settle in, mainly by annoying the staff, while Jules bumps into the Duke's living son, Prince Ashton, played by Sam Hewan? As in, regular on the next Bond rumour circuit, Sam Hewan here playing the son of a character played by a former James Bond actor? That seems incredibly noteworthy. Jules immediately makes a tit of herself after getting all flustered because Prince Ashton is just so dreamy and everything, but he's quite cold with her, which we start to understand more when we are introduced to his stern, no-nonsense father, the Duke, played of course by Sir Roger Moore. The flustered family arrive late to dinner and Jules accidentally kicks a doorstop, which doesn't seem like that much of a big deal, but everyone's looking at them like they arrived with their underwear on their heads and lobbed a dead goat on the table. Hi. You should be brought the right family. Do they know that knocking a doorstop is a crime punishable by death in this country? Everyone gets introduced, and the filmmakers are ready to put a fine point on the fact that Jules is not actually related by blood to the Duke or the Prince, just in case anyone in the audience forgot the family makeup here and was ready to cry incest at this plot. So, kids, this is your Uncle Ashton. Hello there. Is he your uncle too? <laughs> no, sweetie, um... I'm not related to them. So the romance we're about to embark on is totally fine, legal, and won't result in inbred babies. Moore clearly has a lot of fun playing up the Scrooge-like part, and he's a genuine joy to see on screen no matter what the project. Castleberry sure seems beautiful. Nonsense. It's a cold, clammy, miserable place. This is one of the great man's final acting roles, and he still has a twinkle in his eye. He still has screen presence. And, I mean, look, this is a Hallmark Channel Christmas movie. I am not expecting anything beyond tropes and potboiler stuff, but between Moore, Hewan, and McGrath, I think that this, like, I think this film has a genuinely strong lead trio. I like each of these actors a fair amount in their roles. The Duke admits he became estranged from the children's father after he married into Jules's titleless family 
correctly and is now slightly begrudgingly looking to rectify that. After dinner is done, we learn that the Duke has become especially prickly since the death of his son and needs a good talking to about the meaning of Christmas. I want to know why I brought these kids here if it wasn't to give them a Merry Christmas. And I'm not talking about some creepy wannabe holiday in a clammy castle where everybody's walking around like Dawn of the Living Dead. I'm talking about a holly jolly Christmas with bells and bows and a big, fat, messy, sappy Christmas tree with twinkling lights so Santa knows where the heck we are. She's fucking mental. The next day, the family head into the village, which just kind of looks like a single street. But boy, do they have an awful of orphans for a relatively small place. Doesn't give you a whole lot of faith in Castlebury's mortality rate. Just a sidebar on Castlebury as a principality for a moment, because hey, we're in this deep. Uh, it's a fictional European country, though filming took place in Romania. This creates a bit of a strange dynamic, though, as we'll see that later on, most of the nobility that appear in the film will have English accents, whereas the servants tend to have Eastern European accents. Presumably the production brought in a load of Eastern European actors so that they can fulfill its quota of local on-screen talent in order to film in Romania, perhaps even get some tax breaks, I don't really know, but it's odd that they just make this a fictional country because I'm pretty sure that they just want this to be the UK and they could have maybe even just said that this was the UK and no one would question it, but I guess that they're covering for themselves by having all of these non-US and UK accents in this by just saying that it's a made-up country? I mean, Castlebury just flat out sounds like a UK county, like Canterbury, rather than a European principality country, whatever this thing is supposed to be. But hey, you know what? I don't think the filmmakers ever thought that anyone in their right mind would spend this much time considering the population demographics of Canterbury, and I kind of hate myself for spending this much time on it, so let's move on. Jules and Maddie pick out a Christmas tree to take back to the castle, while Milo gets involved in a scuffle with one of the local orphans. Love how the camera suddenly goes handheld here to punctuate the action. It's one of the very few times in this whole thing that the camera isn't on a tripod and it's just for these few shots and then it's like someone reminded the director that this is a Hallmark production and a handheld camera is practically an auteur flourish, so best rein it in. The trio take the tree back to the castle where Prince Ashton has just returned from a hunt, but don't worry animal lovers, the prince hasn't actually been tearing foxes to pieces with his dogs. Well, I find fox hunting cruel and barbaric. Which is why I advocated the ban on hunting them. Well then what were you hunting? A man. A man? A man? Well this story took a turn, I wasn't expecting things to go into a dangerous game territory. Is Jules gonna have a 15 minute head start to flee into the woods before being pursued as blood sport? I'm dragging a fake scent. It's called a drag hunt. I'm sorry. Oh, phew. <laughs> That's a relief, especially as Jules did seem a little weirdly into the idea that the prince was actually hunting a man, which is a bit strange. Ah, oh, got my hopes up for a second there. The prince then introduces Jules to Lady Arabella, his snooty girlfriend, who thinks Jules is so uncouth, even if she does know more about antiques than Lady Arabella ever will, and shows her up by correctly identifying the designer of the sandwich plate. Actually, it's a hand-painted sandwich tray by Lewis Bilton. You mean by Christopher Landry? No. I mean Lewis Bilton. Lewis Bilton, you say? Let's have a look. Well, sis, I'm afraid it's one for the Americans. Darling? Ooh, Lady Arabella might as well just hang herself now, there's no recovering from that burn. Jules' all-American can-do spirit starts to endear her to the staff and bring joy back to the castle, melting the heart of even the icy duke who does a 180 in a matter of moments on the subject of Christmas after providing a jump scare to knock the eggnog out of your hands. Father's favourite ornament. Pretty. <laughs> what is this? Jesus! Yes, this is cheesy, yes, it's low-hanging sentimental fruit, and yet, there is something about Roger's performance here that works to infuse me with some festive joy, and the man can still act. I mean, I genuinely think he's really good here when he's talking about his favourite Christmas ornament and the fond memories he has of his brother. My elder brother and I were, were each given one at Christmas. And I broke my head. <laughs> oh, how I cried. He gave me his. Thank you, Jules. It is a lovely tree. I think, um... I think someone's cutting onions somewhere. Jules's words certainly work her magic, or maybe the Duke was just visited by three ghosts in the middle of the night, because the next morning he decides he's going to throw a Christmas ball, with only five days to go until the big day. Meanwhile, Jules and the Prince grow ever closer, especially over the course of a dance lesson. You're too stiff. 
Well, I could say the same thing about you. What? I meant your arm. I meant your penis! Anyway, the joyous mood is quickly quashed by Lady Toffee Nose, who puts a stop to all this fun. Terribly sorry to interrupt your little, ooh, ghetto dance. Oh, why must you have joyous fun with them when you could be cold and miserable with me? Things are obviously going much too well and we need to introduce some conflict to bring the narrative to its end of act two low point. So, contrived though it may be, Jules overhears a conversation between the Duke and the Prince and mistakenly believes that they're slagging her off. <sighs> Do we have to invite her? I don't suppose we can uninvite her. No, let's just hope she's not an embarrassment, that's all. In terms of drama, I'm surprised that they would opt to have the main source of character conflict come from a fairly strained, but nonetheless honest, misunderstanding. Like, you have the evil current girlfriend right there, couldn't she have been plotting against Jules or create the misunderstanding deliberately? I, it, it feels like something more deliberate would have been a bit more satisfying than it just kind of happening randomly like this. Lady Arabella could have been a much more delicious villain, but um, hey, this is a Hallmark channel movie, maybe that would have been too mean-spirited? Meanwhile, Milo breaks his way into one of the castle's forbidden rooms, which just so happens to be the old office of his dad, who, judging by all that powder on the desk, really loved his cocaine. Maybe this is a spiritual sequel to The Wild Geese, and the reason for the cause of the father's death is that Roger made him eat a block of the stuff. I'm only kidding, of course, it's not cocaine, we want the whole family to enjoy this film, it's just that the window blew open and the snow came in. The prince pops up here to have a heart-to-heart -heart with Milo. The love he had for you will always be here. Small thing, but I did quite like how the death of Jules's sister and the brother-in-law isn't just forgotten about in the first 20 minutes. It could have been just a narrative device to get Jules into this situation, but there are a handful of scenes that deal with the family's collective grief, and I thought it was just the right level of sentimentality for such a thing. I don't ever feel like it becomes overwrought, which it really could have done. Anyway, it's the day of the ball, and with the laundry malfunction meaning that Jules's dress is destroyed, she takes it as a sign that she needs to get the heck out of Dodge and pulls out her... I I guess any time you want return flight ticket back to Buffalo for uh, reasons. I still don't get why you're going home early. Oh, I gotta go back and get a job. <laughs> Ah, yes, well, fair enough. I do hear that December 25th is quite popular for job interviews. So much for the Christmas cheer, Jules, leaving the kids with the family that they barely know, but at least she has the good grace to help them get ready for the ball first. <laughs> I'll 007 eat your heart out. No, oh, 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 she, she said the thing, she said the thing! Who knows, kid, maybe after Hewan's had a go at the role, you'll be the right age to take over, and then we'll have a film with three Bonds in it. As the ball gets underway, Jules takes her leave via the back door, much to the aghast of the staff who pursue her to the train station, though I guess there must have been no suitable train stations in Romania for them to film at, because this is just a building on a corner. But the important thing is that the staff have replaced Jules's dress, and charmed by this, Jules decides that she will go to the ball after all. No wonder she's in such a dire financial situation. I mean, she's just so willy-nilly with international flights. I'd have been like, uh, sorry, my seat's already been paid for and everything, but no, for Jules, a shimmer of sequins, and she's happy to change all of her plans. Back at the ranch, the prince breaks up with his awful girlfriend. Hooray! Because they have a conversation where she apparently exceeds his acceptability of awfulness. But I don't care about being happy. I care about being a princess. It's over. And Jules arrives at the ball in her gown, much to the confused looks of the rest of the guests for some reason, and I don't really know if we're supposed to think that the dress is actually out of place amongst everyone else, or what, really? But whatever, Roger Moore's wife of the time, Christina Tholstrup, appears during this sequence as a guest, and even gets a little mention in the dialogue, which I thought was pretty cute. Lady Christina. With the festivities underway, Jules confronts the prince about what she overheard previously, so the prince can explain it was all just one big misunderstanding, and they're fine to dance together, much to the aghastness of the fellow guests. By Jove! This obviously cues up Jules to speechify. I may not know much about parenting, but I know we don't need money to make us happy. I love the reaction shots to that line, especially from this lady. I love how it clearly takes a moment for the penny to drop what Jules has just said, and then she looks so confused by it. The Duke at this point is completely won over by Jules' down-to-earth morals and tells off Lady Arabella and her family for suggesting that Jules is actually only in this for the money. So Jules lost a job. You have never worked a single day in your life. And if you ask me, Lady Arabella Marchand of Belmont, 
You're the one who is all fur coat and no knickers. So hooray, the misunderstandings are cleared up, the antagonists are turfed out, past grievances are aired and resolved neatly and without issue, so all that's left to do is for the Duke to present some badly dubbed Santa he hired to the children. Come on, children. Santa, why doesn't your voice match your lip movements? Ho ho ho, they'd have to pay me more if this was my own voice. Sometime after the Prince and Jules are married, so no more job searching for her. I swear I wasn't marrying for the money, but I have to admit it's awfully convenient that I can have both love and money. So it's literally a fairy tale ending as a horse-drawn carriage takes the prince and princess off to their honeymoon, and that is the end of A Princess for Christmas. That is A Princess for Christmas, and yes, it's a Hallmark Channel movie, and with that comes certain expectations. This is not reinventing the wheel, it's a pretty bland film, but to have on as background noise while you're doing some Christmas present wrapping? You could do worse! If the film has anything going for it, it's the lead cast, all of which really do elevate the material by turning in very likeable, suitably charming performances. Kate McGrath and Sam Hewen are both very attractive, squeaky clean, postcard perfect leads for this kind of thing, and I obviously got a huge kick out of seeing Roger Moore in this. Towards the latter years of Moore's life, he mainly did a lot of voiceover work and spoofs of himself, so A Princess for Christmas is one of his final acting roles where he's really physically there playing a part, and I think he's great here. Again, just just his presence elevates proceedings, and he's clearly having some fun playing up some of the grumpier moments. The plot is cookie cutter, the production values are standard, and I think it's a shame that they don't make more of the location, but the film never really aspires to be anything more than what it is. It does what it says on the tin, and that's that. If you have seen A Princess for Christmas, then please do let me know your own thoughts on it in the comments section below. As well as any other, you know, Bond-adjacent Christmas movies that you've seen. It might be fun to cover more Bond actors in Christmas movies in the future, so uh, yes, do let me know below, and who knows, maybe next year I will be covering the movie that you suggest. And also below, you can of course click the subscribe button and the Mrs. Bell notification button to stay super up to date on future video uploads. There are links to a variety of my social media pages, so please do follow me on those if you care to do so. And with all that being said, and until next time, Bond fans, happy Christmas, and so long for now.